Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that we have been singing that you are king. That you reign above all. You are king in heaven. Lord God, you're seated on a throne. And Lord, you're not just sat there barking our orders, but you're sitting there with your love, with your grace, with your power and your mercy flowing into our lives. That you come and take our place with us, Holy Spirit, Lord God in us. And that you, you reveal to us the things of heaven. And that you show us, Lord God, what you are doing beyond what we can see in the physical. And so, Lord God, I do ask, as we've been singing this morning, that they won't be words, but realities, that our hearts, eyes will be open. Whether we know God or not this morning, that Holy Spirit will open up our eyes to the revelation of Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we see you more this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So as Jesus was seen as King in heaven. Has anyone of you played uh, the, the game or seen someone play musical, musical chairs? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone loves to musical chairs. They want to end up on the floor playing musical chairs. Yeah. Yeah. It's all whips the chair out the way and you know, crash to the ground. <laughs> you know, how it works is you eventually get down to one chair, isn't there? And there's two people, it could be three, depending on how you play the game. If you really want crazy, get a load of kids running around in one chair. If you want a big fight, bust up, that's the way to do it. Get running around that chair, running around. As soon as the music goes, bang, only one person. To get on that chair. <coughs> this morning I want us to take home the truth. There is only one person that can sit on the throne of your heart, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen. There is only one person. Everything else will try and take that place. They jostle around, they run around and around your heart, trying to get that one seat. But I can guarantee you, if you press Jesus Christ in that one seat, your life will never be the same again. Amen. There will be something more purposeful, more content, more fulfilling, more peaceful because Jesus is in his rightful place. And this morning, I just I, I want to encourage us that, that, that that's, what we, that's what we're pursuing here. We're not pursuing anything else as a church other than Jesus Christ being in front of where he should be. Now, that song comes from Isaiah. In the book of Isaiah, he says, I see the Lord high and lifted up. It's potentially a picture of Christ in his throne room. And, and you know, it says the train, the corner, the just edge of his garment fills the temple. The magnitude of God he sees and he's humbled by it. He's, he's brought to his knees and he says, man, I'm a man of unclean lips. You know, what, what have I got to offer? I just mess up constantly. And God comes and touches his lips and he purifies him and sends him on a corner. And you know, that encourages me. And it says to me, whatever pit I've got myself into, you know, to be honest, we pretty much get our ourselves in our own pits. <coughs> He's loving and gracious and good enough to get us out. But he's, he's in the business of setting us back on, on a path and into his love and into his purposes again. And so I just want to look at the book of Revelation for a moment because the book of Revelation, as you've heard me say many times before, is about Jesus. If you've ever wondered about the beast and the crazy little bugs that fly around with faces on them, it's about Jesus. Now they're not, of course, they're against Jesus. But the whole point is is that this book is to say, it doesn't matter what the world throws at us, it doesn't matter how dark and bleak it gets, Jesus is still seated on his throne. Revelation 1, verse 12. And this is this guy called John, who's very close to Jesus, he hung out with him, he, think, he thought he was Jesus' best, I don't, I don't know whether he was or not, but that's what he thought he was. And he's, up, he's on an island, and he's, he's imprisoned, and he's been... He's been flogged, beaten, he's even boiled alive, and yet he's still going. This guy's a miracle in, in, in every single way. And he's in the spirit on the Lord's day. So he's in some kind of um, connection with God. And it says in verse 12, I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven gold lampstands. In the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a gold sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white. Like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of the waters. In his right hand, oh, too many pages, held seven stars from his mouth and came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in all its full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. What a revelation that John gets through his life. This, this is the John that hung out with the Jesus that was the carpenter. And this same Jesus, through his death and resurrection, is now glorified as king in heaven. And he sees a totally different picture of this Jesus. 
This Jesus is now victorious. This Jesus is now king upon a throne. And he's so blown away by what he sees, he literally falls down on his face as though he's dead because he can do nothing else. Amen. You know, the song with that goes, I can only imagine what it'd be like when one day I'm with God. When I, you know, when I sing, when I fall down, you know, I don't know about you, but if the times that I've experienced the majesty, the glory, the greatness of God, the only thing I can do is get down upon my knees. Mm. And at times I want to get down on my face, but sometimes I'm too worried about what people think to do. it. And yet, he's a king of my life, so that I would just get prostrate. Prostrate, that's the right word, isn't yeah. it? John prostate. He's the one that's prostrate. The whole ground is before the king of my life. Go <laughs> The eyes like burning fire. You just you can imagine that when you look into the eyes of Jesus, you're melted by his love and his purity. And you're just drawn in. You know, some people have got eyes you get drawn into, haven't they? And they just get drawn into people's eyes and you're Jesus. We see this picture of wow, just blown away, his feet like burnished bronze, his, everything about him, his goodness and purity and wholeness, his voice. Wow, a voice. Have you heard the voice of God here this morning? Yeah. Have you heard it when it's like many waters? You know, have you been down to Becky Falls or to some other uh, waterfall or water area and just you stand in the quietness of that area and you just hear the water <coughs> running over all those stones. And for a moment, you're kind of transported out of the hassles and the, and the cares of the world into this place of peace. I wonder why the psalmist wrote that he's my shepherd and he lays with me beside Still pulls a quiet more. He brings us into these places where no one else can. And when he's enthroned on high, when he's thrown in our hearts, there's no room for anything else. Amen. King of glory. Lays down upon his face as though dead. But Jesus lays his hands on him and says, Fear not. I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Encouraging him that you know death didn't hold him. We looked at this last week that, that he broke through death itself, won a great victory over it through his resurrection. And because Jesus is raised to life, we know that we too can be raised to life for eternity. I died and behold my life forever mine. I have the keys of death and Hades. Right there for the things that you've seen. Those that are and those that are to take place. And then he goes on to say, what well, the lampstand and the stars mean. Wow, the first and the last, the living one. You know, God is, is not a created being like us. In the book of Corinthians, chapter 15, it says the first Adam became a life, a living creature. That God breathed life into him, he became a living creature, but it says the second Adam, that's Jesus, he became a life giving spirit. He's the one that brings life to us. You know, and what, what do we see around us as we, as we go around our, our world and our days and our jobs and our social settings? And our, the whole world screams to us that this brings us life and that brings us life. And if we achieve this, then that's what you're going to get most out of life. And if you become the best bass player in the world, that's what's going to give you the, the greatest of life. And yet we're sold into a complete and utter lie. Right. The one that holds the lampstands and the stars, the one that holds the angelic and the spiritual realm, the one that holds this world together and this church together, Jesus Christ. Only He. Only He is the one that fulfills everything that we need. I love what it says in Revelation 19. We see this other picture of Jesus, and I'm, I'm just reading this out because I want our hearts to be gripped. By this Jesus who is riding out for us. He fights for us. He stands up for his people. He loves passionately. Revelation 19.11. I saw heaven open. And there was this white horse. I always wanted a white horse when I was a kid. I thought I'd be a jockey. Because I was short. <laughs> and then I thought it would be nice to have like, some kind of white stallion. Wouldn't it? Well Jesus has got one. <laughs> Faithful and true in righteousness. He judges and makes war. Do you see that? His righteousness, he judges and makes war. We've got sometimes this wrong concept that he's an angry God just trying to create problems and disaster. He says, no, it's for what is right and what is best these things happen. That everything he does is for good. Here we go again. His eyes are like a flame of fire. 
and on his head are many diadems, crowns, points to a crown, showing his royalty, his kinship. And he has a name written that no one else knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. Jesus is the Word, and in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit existed eternally, the one God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following her white horses. Imagine that. You know, sometimes when you think about an army, you think about, you know, kind of getting a bit dirty, putting a bit of war paint on, you know, a bit of camo, maybe, or something like that. You want to go in under the radar, get your camouflage on, do a bit of crawling through the undergrowth. No, no, God's armies don't need to do that. They're arrayed in fine linen. They're looking pretty... Smart, you know, they've got their best shirt on, they've got their Sunday shirt on, and we've got their Sunday shirt on, have we beaten that out of this church now? <laughs> I'm actually not wearing shorts, can you believe that? We see, I had to prize them for my body, that was why. Um, <laughs> he's got his best suit on, he's got, they've got their Armani's on, they're riding out in white linen. What? You're going to get dirty? Do you not realise that you have to put that through the washing machine? just shows God's splendor, his glory, that he's won. He goes out in charge with the armies of heaven riding alongside him, in fine linen, white as pure, following on white horses. Awesome. <laughs> From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the few of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings. Lord of Lords. Amen. He's got his tattoo and he's there forever saying, King of Kings. Amen. See, if you're worried about tattoos, don't worry about it. Jesus has one. Yeah. And he rides out in glory. <laughs> and he rides out in power. And he rides out in majesty. Because he's King. Amen. What's in front on your heart this morning that's not here? What's it thrown in my heart this morning this night? Where have we set up for that lie? Where this morning where we ask the Holy Spirit just come on our Holy Spirit? We ask you, Holy Spirit, just to continue to just pour yourself into our lives, into our minds, into our hearts. Lord God, as we continue in your word this morning, just Jesus become real we are. We thank you, Jesus, your King of heaven, riding out in glory. Lord, thank you that we get to be part of your mission and your plan. And Lord God, we thank you that even, even the war that you wage is for good and love for heart. And we trust in your sovereignty and your goodness. Amen. Amen. Lord, I want us to, to feast upon this Jesus this morning. The King of Kings. You know, we say these words so often and so many times, and yet we can lose something of the the enormity of what it means. The enormity of what it means to those of us that choose to have him as our king and captain. That we should look for opportunities where we can, can feast upon this God and allow him to nourish every part of our being and our soul. If you look in the book of John, John chapter 6, Incredible, incredible passage. Verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, this is Jesus. They said to him, Rabbi, it just means teacher, when did you come here? Jesus says to them, I say to you, you're seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of loaves. He just fed the 5,000. Do not labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you for on him. God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to them, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. It's written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father 
gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, so give us this bread. Let's eat it always. Mm. Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Wow. Can you believe that? The reality that if Jesus is king upon the throne of your heart, you never lack wants. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Why do we want so much all the time? Because the Lord is not our shepherd, he's not our king. He's been unseated from the throne of our hearts. And yet Jesus encouraged them. Yeah, you saw this incredible miracle. 5,000 people, men plus children, women and children. And you saw that miracle and you marveled at it. And even 12 loaves of baskets were filled up afterwards that God is a God of plenty. And yet what he's saying to them, there's something greater than even the food that you've eaten and the miracle that you see. There's a miracle that stands before you today in his name is Jesus Christ. And if he becomes our sustenance, our Lord, we shall never want, never become hungry, never become thirsty. And that's not talking about eating and drinking, that's talking about our hearts. That our hearts get just deceived and captured and taken away. And he says that will never happen when Jesus is in the right place. John 11. <laughs> the story is, is that Jesus' friend has died and he's going to come rise into death, to, to life. And he says, right in the middle of it, when Martha was asking him all these kinds of questions in verse 25, he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So not only is he saying that do we become fulfilled, but our life becomes full of his life too. You know, we looked at and started touching on this idea that, that, immortal, that mortality can be swallowed up by immortality. That Jesus' life can so permeate our life that literally the ravages of of sin and disease and sickness no longer hold us. And even age does not decay our body in the same way, but we are so full of the life of Christ. Remember in the garden they ate the tree of life, and then they were thrown out of the tree of life. And that life-living creature, Adam, who messed up and ruined it, came, in, came out of the garden and was left in his sin and his problems and his brokenness, which infected the world. And then Jesus, the second Adam, the life giving spirit now reclaims everything that was lost in the, in the garden. And if, if, if mortality, if sickness and age was lost in the garden, it's got to be reclaimed through Christ. I am, Jesus says, the resurrection and the, and the life. If you have the Son, you have life. 1 John 5. The reality of Jesus is it transforms and changes everything. You know, and we still sometimes are struggling in our natural selves and we know that we've got ailments and diseases that are holding us back at times. And this isn't about anyone doing anything wrong. This is about us as a church just finding our satisfaction and our kingship in Jesus until his life fully invades our lives. John 14. Just to build upon it. Verse 6. Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have known me, you would have known my Father. From now on you do not know him and have seen him. You do know him and have seen him. That Jesus was literally saying, I am the representation of the Father. I'm not just the direction in which you need to go in. I'm not just some concept of what truth is about. I'm not just something, a vague idea of what maybe life should look like. He is those things. When we gain Christ, we gain truth. When we gain Christ, we gain full understanding of who he is and who we are in him. When we gain Christ, we understand what our life is. We don't just gain the way, we are become the way. Do you know that the first Christians were called followers of the way? They became the way because Christ became, came in them and then you become the way so that others can know the way. He is life. He is life. 
in every sense of the word. The fullness of anything we would ever need in this world. Full life to us. And the kingship of Jesus opens up his kingdom to us of fullness and of life so that we can impact the world. And a world that is searching for God but doesn't even always know. Matthew 16, an incredible passage. I'm just going to read through these as, as we go on. Verse 13, what an incredible story we read here with Jesus. He's just fed the 4,000 this time. God likes to bring food. You know, I'm really up for that. I think it's great. We need to get more food, maybe. Verse 13, now Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi. And he says to his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? So who do they say? He's basically saying, you know, I've been around for a while, I've done a few miracles. Who do people think I am? Thank you for that, sorry. Who do people think I am? Oh man, that's just what I'm <laughs> They said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, well, who... Do you say that I am? What a question that maybe we can ask ourselves this morning. Who is Jesus to you? Not what other people, not what other people have told you is. Not what you've heard on UCB radio. Not what you've kind of gleaned from your daily readings. Not, not what you've been taught on a Sunday or what the world has told you what it is. Who is Jesus to you? Let's bring this into the person of ourselves. Let's Start actually questioning ourselves. If he's king on high, if he wants to bring life to our bodies, if we want to feed on a daily basis, we need to get to the place where we want to discover this Jesus for ourselves. He said to them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. A revelation that only heaven can bring to us. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, Peter literally means rock, Petra means rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What a, what a charge to be given to his people. He's saying, look, if you, get, you understand who I am, if you get to the place where you discover who Jesus is for yourself, if Jesus becomes rightly enthroned upon your heart, you get the whole deal. You get everything. You get him. You get life. You get wholeness. You even get the keys to the kingdom of God. See, God is a king in heaven, and he's come back. And through his death and resurrection, he has won back those keys that Adam handed over to Satan. And he's taken them back and he's planted them firmly back into the church's hand. It says, whatever, whatever you bind on earth or in heaven, it will happen. He's saying that in the place where Jesus is enthroned, anything we ask in his name will be given. <laughs> he was saying to us that even if you said to hate or Jump into the river team. It will happen. Have you seen God move on? Have you seen God move in such power that you are blown away? You know, sometimes it's just the subtle things that we can easily walk on by and miss. And yet God is constantly at work, opening up the eyes of our hearts so that we might see. <coughs> Who he is. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The kingdom of heaven, the keys to it are in the church's hands. That's why Jesus says at the beginning, or they retell the saying of Jesus at the beginning of Acts 1, where he says, Wait, you know, hang around for a little bit. Don't get too busy doing stuff quite yet. But wait. Wait to be clothed, empowered overwhelmed, rained on by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And then you will be witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, and the world. Samaria, the world. It's the Holy Spirit that inspires and empowers and fills our lives for us to see Jesus and to live out His mission on this earth. 
Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples. What did he say before that? No. All authority is mine. Jesus stands up, just about going back onto his throne. He's going to kick back on his throne and just chill out for a few and then he <laughs> And he stands up and he goes, all authority is mine, go therefore. So what does that mean? He's telling us to go in his authority. The keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. God wants us to begin to understand what it means to be a child of his. <laughs> of a king upon the hearts of our throne, where not only do we receive life to our bodies, not only do we receive peace and understanding and the love of God, but we begin to see that the world has been given to us for God's goodness and for his love to be seen. And that begins to help us to see the days, the day that we, each day that we take very differently. It's now not just about the mundane things that we're bored with, but we see that everything we do, we do for the glory of God. And that it has a supernatural eternal purpose as it is in frame on our hearts. I love what it says in, in the book of Corinthians 2. Just to, to blow us a little bit more in our minds. In verse 9, Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, You know, it's written this. What no eye has seen, what no eye has seen, nor ear hurt, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Let me just take my time over that for a moment. It's saying to us, there is nothing you have quite seen yet. There is nothing that you've ever heard yet. There's nothing that you could have concocted in your heart even after the most spicy vindaloo. <laughs> You cannot even imagine above your wildest dreams what God has prepared for you. Amen. Just take the reality of that for a moment. Whatever you and I dream, and you know, I've been accused of some crazy dreams at times. Only occasionally. There is nothing you can dream that is bigger than God. And I want us to be a church of dreams. A, a, a church that doesn't just dream and wake up in the morning and go, that was lovely. That's a good dream. Mary was just telling me about a dream and she leaked my car and started driving it. <laughs> I'm hiding the keys, I tell you. <laughs> but she's woken up and she's not done it. Let's not be those kind of dreamers. Let us be dreamers that step into everything that God has given us a dream for. You know, my heart as a church is that we realise the dreams that's placed in each and every one of us. And if your dream isn't being heard, come and shout it in our ear a bit louder. And say, Oi! You said! <laughs> I go, oh yeah, actually. <laughs> to dream the things that God wants, to have the vision of God, to see what we can see with our human eyes, and to be willing to step into it, whatever He asks. That's the privilege we get for being Christians, for those of us that have given our lives to Jesus. There is nothing that is impossible. You know, we hear this all the time, we hear the kids' songs and sing it, you know, there's nothing impossible, but there really isn't. There really isn't anything that is impossible for you. I've been to have a few days in Bristol just chatting to some other church planners and leaders and just hearing their stories. You know, the danger sometimes with these things is you run after grants and things like that, and you try to make things happen. You know, God gives you a vision, you try to make things happen. And the thing that God keeps reminding me that it's not by my mind or by my but by His Spirit. Mm. And that's the kind of church we're about. Amen. That we step out into the unknown, not because we've got it figured out, not because we're brilliant or right, but we have the privilege that we get to do it with and for Jesus. Matthew 5, the Beatitudes. You remember what it says there? It's this long list that Jesus kind of pours out to his people saying, yeah, this, is what you, this is the kind of heart you need. And the one that constantly sticks out to me, I remember Jane talking about it years ago, is the one in verse 6. And this is where I think the heart of the matter is. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, 
for they shall be satisfied. Filled. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty for Jesus and his right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. A heart which is enthroned by King Jesus, who is after him and nothing else, who is desperate for him. How hungry are we as a church this morning to be like Peter, who saw Jesus Christ in a way no one else did. <coughs> and because of it, he was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. How hungry are you to see him above every other desire in your world? How hungry am I? Are you hungry and thirsty? You know, you know if we're hungry, I don't know if you've ever been hungry, but you know when you get, I'm not just talking about the munchies here. No. I'm talking about super hungry. I suspect many of us haven't been. But I've seen and know of people that have been so hungry they would do anything to get something to eat. Anything. And sometimes illegal, illegal stuff, and I'm not suggesting we do that. But they would give everything. You know, if a tree is thirsty, it will send down its roots. It will continue to send it down until it finds food. How willing are you to spend time in God's Word, to send your roots down into His Word, because you are desperate for the only thing that nourishes your soul. And that's why we did soul food. That's why we did the weekly meditation. It was there as another opportunity in the week just to get the Word of God into our hearts again, to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us in the way that He wanted to. How hungry are we to discover this Jesus in this book? Because this book is Jesus. He is the Word. Amen. If an animal is hungry, what does it do? It goes out hungry. If we're hungry, will we go out looking for other people that don't know you? Mm -hmm. We call it treasure hunting. Mm -hmm. Finding the treasure that God has placed in every single human being and helping and praying and asking that God will allow them to see the treasure of the worth. Mm -hmm. If you're hungry, you will spend time as well, but you will also be out there with every opportunity, invite others to find out about this amazing incredible, beautiful, loving God. Amen. What happens if you've got kids and you're in a family and they're hungry, you make them something to eat, you serve them some food, don't you? If we are hungry for God, we would serve one another. Not only would we spend time in His Word, not only would we tell others about Him, but we would serve one another with the desire of nothing in return because that's what love says. Amen. Love says, I will give, I will serve, and expect nothing in return because Jesus did not come to be served but to serve and he gave up his life as a ransom for many, for everyone. See the mark of how hungry you are, how desperate you are for Jesus is that your life looks different. See we say you come to Jesus, it's free, it totally is. Salvation is free. But to live for Jesus costs your life. Amen. To give your life fully over to this God costs you everything. <laughs> to the point where I say, it doesn't matter because nothing else is as good as you, Jesus. Philippians 3 puts this into context and we're on our way to the rounding the sun. Paul, incredibly intelligent well-educated man. He literally had the world at the grasp of his fingertips. He could have achieved the most highest of states and standards. And he goes on in verse 4, chapter 4, he says, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Can you believe that? You know, he's a Jewish guy that, that was led under the law, and he was literally saying he followed it so rigorously that he could have been classed as blameless. Wow. But whatever gain I had, 
whatever future prospects I had, whatever career move I was looking to make next, whatever educational system I was looking forward to, I count it as loss, as nothing, for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss. That means he's literally saying there is nothing, and it's not just words. He's saying there is nothing in this world that can compare. There is nothing in this world that satisfies. There is nothing in this world that captures my gaze like Christ does. For the sake of Christ, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's saying it doesn't even matter whether God uses me to bring thousands into his kingdom. My desire is to be satisfied fully in Jesus, that I may gain Christ and nothing else. Amen. He's so desperate for more of God. He's done it the other way. He's tried the good way. He's tried to follow rules and regulations. He's tried to work his way up through the career ladder. He's realized it doesn't give him anything of lasting value. Whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Instead, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake. I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them as dumb, excrement, rubbish. In order that I may gain Christ. His whole desire is how can I get more of Jesus into this, in, into this finite heart of mine. And be found in him. And how can I then get myself into Jesus so that he covers me with everything that he is. Not having therefore then a righteousness of my own that comes from the Lord. Not just trying to be a goody two-shoes, <laughs> but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Since you say, it isn't about us trying to be good, moral people. You know, that happens when you gain Jesus. It's just a byproduct. It's a get Christ and the rest follows. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. And may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this, or I am already perfect. But I press on to make him my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He's so overwhelmed when he met that... He had that revelation. He met Jesus in person on the road to Damascus. He was so overwhelmed by who he was that everything else just disintegrated in his life. And now he's living in a way that he gets more of Jesus into him and that more of him gets into Jesus. So that the resurrection life of Jesus becomes his. And this can't just be talking about the future. Because that means he's saying, I'm not sure if I'm going to be saved. Because he says, I, not that I've obtained it yet. So this was salvation. We're all lost. He's saying, I want the resurrection life of Jesus, not just for when I die and I get a new body, but I want it now. Amen. That as I gain Christ now, I gain life. I gain resurrection power in my flesh yes. now. And although I haven't obtained it yet, I will press on. I will forget what is behind. I will forget what's happened in the past. I won't be held back in my own insecurities and problems and weaknesses. I won't allow my past to dictate my future, but I will press on. I will run on. I will strive into gaining Christ because in Him is life. Because if you have the Son, you have life. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the bread of life. He's our everything. And we run not even after what He can give but because of who He is and allow Him to satisfy our hearts and our souls and our lives. And that is what God is encouraging us with today. He's a king seated on a throne. And he doesn't just want to be a throne in heaven. He wants it to be a throne in our hearts. And here's my challenge for us. <clears throat> this is never going to happen if we're just Sunday Christians. This isn't ever going to happen if we just do our Sunday service and that's it. I heard somebody say this, you won't grow sitting in a row. <laughs> it 
it's as we do life together. Why, why do we push our connect groups so much? Not because connect groups in themselves are anything special, but because it's where you begin to do life. I cannot encourage you enough this morning, if you're not in a connect group, to get in one. I, I, you might think I just try to plug it. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I grow because of my group, and I thank my group for them. I thank, God, I thank God for my group on a daily basis. I don't know if that made any sense whatsoever. It did in my head. You know, how, how, we're exploring how God wants these things to develop because they're going to be about hanging out together, learning the Bible together, applying together, pastoring each other, discipling each other. It's about body ministry rather than just coming on a Sunday and going and trying to do our stuff in the week. It's saying that every day of the week I've got someone I can pick up the phone to, I can go around the house to, that I can actually spend life with because I want Jesus to be my all and that you, you, that's you guys, you help me to see Jesus. You help me to know Jesus more. You help me to love him more. When I hang out with you, when you share your stories, when I share my stories, we begin to see Jesus. Jesus hung out with the people that were around him all the time. They were out busy doing stuff. They were meeting in the temple. They were having their Sunday celebration. And woo, 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 woo. But then they were getting together in the week as well. And they were just getting it real together. I cannot encourage you enough. You may have had a bad experience. You may have had a bad experience in one of our connect groups. And I'm sorry for that. But don't let it put you off from what God wants to do by allowing you to be immersed in his family. And unashamedly plug in. Get yourself into one of these things. Start sharing with us how you want to see them go and grow. You know, we have to go smaller to grow bigger. We have to become into our smaller groups where we work things out together so that the church can be quick. If we were 500,000 on Sunday that had nothing that was nurturing and discipling and growing and, and, and bouncing off each other and even upsetting each other at times. You know, sometimes we have little barnies in our connect group, you know? You know, and sometimes we have a little bit of a wrestle. You know, we get the table out, put the arms down and say, come on! But we walk away loving Jesus more than each other. Yeah, and I'm not exactly we do sometimes. We do sometimes rub each other up the wrong way. But it's family. Yeah. You won't get that here on a Sunday. You might you could probably trip something up on the way out and see what happens. But, <laughs> but, but by doing life on a daily basis, by trying to hang out together, contact with youth connect, junior connect, adult connect, just connecting. Our slogan from the beginning of this, when God birthed this church, he said, get connected because it's all about connection. Yeah. Are we connected with one another and with God and with our community? When we're hungry for God, we will take any opportunity we can to find Him in each other and see Him formed more in each other. Thank you. Yes. So let's go from here. Knowing that Jesus is King. Amen. Whether He's King in your heart or not, He is King. Yeah. He is King and nothing changes that. But if we just, for a moment, take off whatever is on that little seat and allow him to sit upon the throne of our hearts, our perspective and our life and our worlds will look so different. We will see his kingdom come. Amen. We will see Timoth overwhelmed and wrecked by the love of Jesus. Amen. And the churches, there won't be enough churches groups of people, congregations, whatever we call it, to fulfill those that come into his kingdom. Amen. Amen. Father, we just thank you for your goodness as always, Lord. We just thank you for the way you teach us and, and lovingly correct us at times. Lord, we thank you for the way that you've only got our best interests at heart. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, that you've revealed yourself to us. Oh, Lord, we just thank you that you've revealed yourself to us. Lord, we just ask that that there will be greater and greater revelation. Lord, Lord, that's not us just sitting there going, yeah, just reveal yourself, but actually we will pursue revelation, <coughs> pursue you with each other and for each other and through each other. That, that together we will get to know you more, Lord God, that we will get to get more hungry for you more. That like Paul, we'll get to that place where we're just saying, nothing, absolutely nothing satisfies more than you do, Jesus. And we're hungry to see you more in our lives. Just to know you that little bit more. Lord, I ask that, that God, that you'll just stir us up to, to pursue you together, Lord. 
And Lord, that as we do, Lord, I just thank you that your love and your grace and your power will, will flow through this church, that your kingdom will come. I know it, Lord God, and I just thank you for that. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. Amen.